What was learned from the nurse's health study? And please elaborate on its impact on fat. Well, I've known that nurse's health study personally uh, for since its beginning. I've known the director. He's a fine fellow. He's, got, he's had done an enormous amount of work. They, they put out a ton of really good research, all on humans, by the way. That, that's really important to you know, have that, that, that picture, the image of what's really happening in the case of humans. Is, so they've contributed a lot. They've really contributed a lot. There's, not by any stretch of the imagination, we even want to question that. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, that is just one facet of the information. Good and sufficient in many cases, maybe, <clears throat> but it's one, one perspective. The other perspective is sort of getting down into the nitty gritty of the chemistry and the biochemistry. How do diseases form? What can we learn from that? What, what can we learn from, well, what, basically the so-called mechanisms kind of thing? We call it biological plausibility. We, we live by a certain standard of, you know, uh, of criteria that's used to judge the quality of research in, in our Western world. They refer to Sir Bradford Hill's criteria from epidemiological studies primarily, but among those uh, nine criteria he has published, I think, in the first time in 1960 or so, maybe 64, when he published that really outstanding scientist from the University of Oxford. But in any case, he had this list of things, and we've all kind of lived by that in the years since. One of those criteria, really critical one, he calls it biological plausibility. Okay, it's one thing to know how to do the research, which he speaks to. There's one, one thing to, to recognize the various kinds of research we get. We can see correlations. We can see here's, here, here's present, now it's not here, cross-sectional, that kind of thing. We, you know, we can, we can talk about all those things, but at the end, and we can form opinions. Oh, it looks like A causes B, if you will. But at the end of the day, we ought to know have we ought to have some information to know if it really works that way under experimental conditions. That's what I call mechanisms or biological plausibility, as he says. It's actually learning how it works. And that was the, the end of the spectrum that I found myself in in the early part of my career, because as I said, I, I had this dilemma. What's true? Does animal protein cause cancer? That's kind of ridiculous. And the only way for me to really get at that, particularly given my bias at the time, my personal bias, the only way to really get at that is let's look at it to see how does it work inside of a cell, inside of a body. And I found a gold mine. I found a gold mine because uh, there we learned a lot about these reactions and how they relate to each other. You know, what are the factors on the outside that affect these reactions, which in turn translate into disease, if you will, or health. Uh, so the nurses' health study, come back to the nurses' health study. They, they've created a, a really a lot of uh, uh, recitable work. You know, it's told, it's, it's discussed a lot, it's presented, uh, which is great, gives you sort of a benchmark. Uh, had some difficulties with some of the findings, but what the heck, that's what we do in science. Uh, I wasn't, you know, in agreement as to some of the conclusions, but, you know, early on, but... Uh, I, I give them a good marks. What does the science show on the health impact from eating eggs or egg whites? <laughs> well, eggs, you know, it's, it's a mixture of some fat, obviously, and protein, obviously, too. A few other things that are micronutrients as well. Um, eggs have been uh, kind of uh, excused, you know, by some groups. They're, they're okay. Uh, you know, if you talk about plant versus animal-based foods, they happen to be animal-based foods, by the way, but they're not requiring the killing of animals. So they kind of get like milk, milk and eggs, that's kind of the product of animals, and they kind of were set aside for their own sort of little grouping, if you, if you will. Uh, but uh, now to go back to the question, you know, what about eggs? Um, there are some studies showing that eggs, higher consumption of eggs is related to colon cancer. And, uh, you know, maybe a few other things. I, you know, again, a little bit reductionist kinds of studies, but nonetheless, but been repeated a few times. Milk, we got a lot of evidence on milk now. That's not a good food. Even though I grew up milking cows, I mean, I, that, I, that was a personal journey for me to try to come to 
to reconcile that the information with my own personal background and my own eating habits. But in any case, milk and eggs, even though they're byproducts of animals, nonetheless, they're problematic because they, the nutritional characteristics of those foods are about the same as the nutritional characteristics of flesh. The worst part, the, the most uh, difficult part of the story, I think, that we have to be concerned about is the fact that we, because the public wants so much dairy and they want so much so many eggs, we built factory farms. Huge factory farms, millions of animals. And so and under that circumstance, here we are, especially in the case of livestock, we're, we're trying to uh, create more and more livestock. They need more and more pasture. They need more and more land. That leads to some serious environmental problems. Not only the deforestation question that comes into play, but also these big farms, they, they lead to uh, groundwater contamination. They lead to soil loss. Uh, they lead to uh, climate change. That's the issue of the day almost. We now know that farming Typical Western kinds of farming, livestock-based farming, is the key determinant of global warming. There's, that, that's it in a nutshell. If we were to really understand uh, that question, then ask question two, why do, why do we want to eat those foods? I mean, everybody can think, well, they, they taste good. I know my, my parents did, et cetera, et cetera. I know that very well. <coughs> I was I was a farmer, essentially, and you know, producing that stuff. That's the way I ate. That's what my parents did. Uh, so that's that's the way it is. But but we have to come in to terms with really asking ourselves really seriously: Is eating animal food the right thing to do? I'm now at my point at the point in my career, even though that's not where it started. I will defend the proposition that we should not eat those foods on the basis of all the science that underwrites the relationship to food. So, um, I don't know, I, 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 I wandered in, in this question here, but I, you were uh, asking about eggs and, and, and milk and how does that relate to, if I hope, hope I gave, shed a little bit of light on that question. Should we add fats to our diet from avocados and olives, raw seeds, raw nuts, hemp oil, flax oil, and even olive oil? Well, the question infers, the way it was asked, the question infers, should we add fats from those substances to something, right? If that's the, if that's the question, we should go easy on that, even though they may come from plants. Because that extra added oil, first off, is addictive. The more we get, the more we want. And uh, unfortunately, the nutrient, the, the, the kind of fat in plant foods, for example, tend to be more polyunsaturates. When they're, when they're, they're great in the food, but when they're taken out and put, sort of used separately, they, they tend to be oxidizable, which in turn leads to the production of what we call free radical, oxygen free radicals, which in turn is related to aging, heart disease, and so forth and so on. So, I say eating those foods, avocados, nuts, coconut. Yeah, I, if we're eating as whole food, we don't make a whole meal of that, that's, that's crazy. Uh, we also can be addicted to that to a bit because they're kind of high in fat, but um, they're good food. Those things are good food. So just like everything else, eat them you know, modestly. Uh, they, they have taste, uh, if they can help us, you know, get more into this arena of eating plant-based foods, you know, more power to them. Uh, I know there's some, some of my colleagues who want to uh, say, no, 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 none of that. I, I, I don't agree with that. What's wrong with eating fish? A lot of people say it's healthy. Yeah, that's right. Again, <laughs> a lot of these things. Um, uh, some, some years ago now, like 30, 40, 50 years ago or so, you know, the early part of my career, there was some evidence that that was arising at the time that uh, fish contained a kind of fat, omega-3 fats, which are anti-inflammatory, for example, 
um, you know, especially in uh, certain kinds of fish, was a good thing. Omega-3 fats are good, they're anti-inflammatory. Their uh, opposing number is that omega-6s, which are pro-inflammatory. So you got anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. Fish had the, more of the anti-inflammatory. Look like a good food, just on that surface alone, you look at it, oh, that's, that's not so bad. And there was some evidence from Eskimos in those days, early days, they were largely living on, on that kind of food and, uh, and not supposedly suffering the consequences. That's was the early research that came out later, that wasn't quite true. They're also suffering some of the same kind of problems. But so in, in meanwhile, too, the fish uh, story, uh, other than being a little bit fishy, I guess, in the beginning, the, the fish story uh, uh, took on a new dimension with all the uh, environmental chemicals that we have, especially the aromatic hydrocarbons and, and uh, halogenated chemicals that we were using. They get into the water and the fish kind of bioaccumulate that stuff in the fat because those are fat soluble stuff. And so some fish are a bit contaminated with the nasty stuff. And we, some of us, found, for example, that some of those chemicals, 95% of the consumption of those nasty chemicals comes from fish. So that's, that's a problem. Of course, the argument is made that, well, we, we can live with that, just don't eat those kind of fish. And there are some fish, you know, they're better, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, I, first, that was one of the last foods I gave up. Um, that and cheese, I guess. Uh, but, um, so the bottom line of fish is that um, there is some, you know, there, let's, let's say it this way. They're, they're certainly not as difficult, not as bad as other kinds of animal foods. But they're not plant foods either. They don't have the antioxidants and that their fiber and stuff that is so important for our health. They just don't have that. And there's lots of those kind of compounds. And so, Fish on balance, yes. I can understand a little bit now and again. Uh, but again, that raises another bigger question, much bigger question. And that's what we, what do we do to our oceans? They're getting polluted. We're killing off the fish population. That's a really serious problem. I don't know how many people really know about that. Uh, but um, in our online course, we've got some very real expert talking about some of that. And uh, so uh, I wish, and the fish are kind of disappearing. <laughs> the fish are kind of disappearing in many cases.